Hello, everyone. I'd like to. I'm not on mic. Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to the Dean's Lecture Series, uh, where we are featuring today Professor Dan Jarafsky of Stanford. I'm Marty Hurst, your host for today. Uh, Dan is a very distinguished scholar. We're very lucky to have him here today. Uh, he was actually an uh, undergraduate and a graduate student here at UC Berkeley sure. in the computer science department. And you were not in linguistics. And linguistics. And linguistics. Yeah. That's what I thought. Linguistics undergraduate, uh, but computer science graduate. Uh, I could tell a lot of stories about Dan because I but was you won't. a graduate student yeah. with him. Uh, but I won't, except for the fact that he is a musical genius. Well, he's good at directing musicals. He can't sing, actually, but he directs musicals. And we had a lot of fun as graduate students here. Uh, but he is, of course, very well known for co-writing the textbook in the field of natural language processing. He's also well known for winning a MacArthur Genius Award, as they're known colloquially, for being a truly interdisciplinary scholar. So. I would have been really envious of him when he won it, except for I thought he deserved it so much when he did. Uh, I really, truly did. And that's because he combines different fields together in a truly unique way. He did this when he was gra in graduate school. Every time I thought I knew something, Dan knew so much more about it in such an interdisciplinary way. He was so well-read. He was so well-rounded, always, ever since I've known him. And he still continues to do research that is well-rounded, interdisciplinary. He doesn't just look at language or just look at computation. He looks at how they combine to impact the world. He worked on dialogue systems before it was fashionable. And of course, when he worked on dialogue systems in the early days, in the 90s, he applied them to the world's most important topic, eating. Yes, the Berkeley <laughs> Eating Restaurant System, I don't know, the acronym was BURP. Of course it was. And that was actually the, the foundation of a lot of what is done in dialogue systems today. And it was around people that were doing neural nets at the ICSI Institute, although it's a little different. The technology is a little different today. And he still combines all of these factors together in his current modern research. And what he's going to talk about today is the social science of NLP. And I, I, I was telling, I was warning him, I could actually take the whole period talking about Dan. So I won't, I will stop now, except for he combined his, I want to add one more thing that he did, which is super awesome, which is all through grad school, Dan talked about food, and he talked about language. And the pinnacle of achievement probably was he put these together in a book called The Language of Food. We never thought he'd finish that book, but he finally did. So you should all read it. It's really fascinating. Let's give a warm welcome to Dan Durafsky. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Is the microphone working? Yes. Excellent. That was a very sweet introduction, very embarrassing. Um, OK, it makes me sound like a know-it-all. So I'm going to give you a know-it-all talk. So um, I'm going to talk about our work on, on policing. And then, because I love food, I'm going to end with a little bit on food at the end. So um, if you are not, um, if you are sentient, you have noticed that there has been a flood of recent viral videos in the US showing inappropriate police use of force. And you also probably know that black Americans report much more negative experiences in their interaction with police than other groups. So for example, 18% of blacks say they've been unfairly stopped by police in the past, while it's much rarer for whites. And um, we, uh, one uh, way of dealing with this problem that police departments are trying to deal with is to build trust between the officers in the community by working on respect. So we know from social science research that a person who's treated with respect in general has more trust in the officer's fairness, the general fairness of the institution, more willing to support the police. So we got the idea of using NLP to help in this process of building trust. So uh, I'm going to talk about three aspects of this work. Could we measure problems in police community interaction? Could we quantify them in ways they haven't been quantified? Could we detect potentials for escalation in police citizen interactions, maybe reduce the chances of violence? And we got this idea of using body camera footage as data. The data comes from the Oakland Police Department, and it's one of the first departments in the country to wear body cameras. So they've had body cameras on at all times since 2010. So it's an amazing amount of data. 
And the idea of our research is to look at common everyday interactions. So there's lots of videos of people getting shot and people, and um, we're looking at not that kind of video. We're looking at the everyday things that happen. It turns out a quarter of US adults get, um, have some contact with the police every year, and mostly it's traffic stops. So most of you, certainly I, have been stopped by the police for traffic stops. This is something that, that is an everyday language. And we're interested in the lab in general, in NLP on everyday language. The team working on this project um, is led by our PI, who's Jennifer Eberhardt. She's a social psychologist. That's my colleague in the building next door at Stanford. And it's very interdisciplinary. We have linguists. Rob Boyd is a linguistic grad student. He's the first author of the first paper I'll talk about. Um, uh, Vinod Prabhakaran is a um, uh, computer science postdoc. He's the first author of the second paper I'll talk about. Nick Camp and Camila Griffiths are grad students in psychology. Um, they're first authors in the third paper, and so on. So very, it's like, oh. Have I, oh my, good, okay, I thought I lost my mic. Um, so it's a very interdisciplinary team. So I'm gonna start with two studies, one I call respect in police language, and one we're talking about dialogue structure. So study one, which came out in PNAS um, last year, asks this question, do police officers treat black community members with a different degree of respect than white community members? And in the context that police departments compare, care about, um, officers showing respect because uh, the departments are trying to build um, relationships with their communities. So we looked at every, started with every interaction between OPD, that's the Oakland Police Department, and the community for April 2014. So that's every single time an officer spoke to a non-officer. Um, 17,000 videos in, in one month. We, took, we started with one month of data. Um, and then we took from that data a subset, which we call this everyday behavior. Just vehicle stops. So uh, you're in a car, officer stops you, officer talks to you. Um, and only if there was a warning, a, a citation, meaning you get a, you get a ticket for a legal right turn, or you get a warning, you just get let off, and the officer says, you know, that was a bad thing, you, but I'm letting you off. So no arrests, no violence, no gunshots. Um, and, um, and furthermore, we, we're going to eliminate the um, Asian and Hispanic community members. Um, so just... Uh, the thousand, approximately a thousand of the 17,000 videos that are vehicle stops with white or black community members. Um, and there's a ton of different, even with that limitation, there's a ton of different officers. So we have a, a pretty big um, data set here. So study one, we transcribed by hand. I'll, re I'll relax that assumption by study two. So here, we hired professional transcribers. And here's all of the complications of dealing with natural social science um, data in the wild. In order for the, anyone to look at the data, the transcribers had to be fingerprinted, background checked by the police department. It took months for each transcriber. They had to be flown to Oakland one by one, because transcription is a service that people do across the country remotely. Um, so they watched the videos, transcribed it, diarized, so we know who's talking to whom. Um, and the resulting data set is about a third of a million words, 36,000 utterances. And in the first paper, we're looking just at utterances by the police to the community members. I'll get back later to utterances from the community member. And I should mention that all the faculty, all the grad students were also fingerprinted. We all spent a day in Oakland. So this is, a, this is high. Um, this, it took forever. It took me months before I could look at the data. Um, are you sure? Yeah. Oh, uh, the officers decided. So, we, so ethno, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, yes. The question was, how did we decide the race of the person being stopped? And the answer is, we took the data from the officer's stop form. So this is a, it's the ethnomethodological decision. It's whatever the officer thought the person's race was. So we don't care what people's biology is. We care what officers think when they're interacting with them. So we took the officer's judgment. Yeah, great question. OK, so this is what a transcript looks like. Um, so in blue, I have officer speech. We have the timing. Um, and then we have, in this case, it was a female driver that was pulled over. The officer explains why they pulled them over. And then they're trying to get the paperwork. And so on. this is the beginning of an interaction. This is the kind of data we're going we're gonna to try to extract stuff from. Um, so, uh, so first, we're going to do a non-computational pre-study. Let's just ask, can humans judge respect from officer language? Could a human look at the officer's sentences that they're saying and judge how respectful they are? Um, and then in this, in, in, just from humans, can we see a difference by the race of the driver? Um, so we um, had humans label. Um, respect. We had 70 coders in the lab, blind to race, label just a subset in our first study, 400 uh, um, utterances by the officer, 400 turns, 
um, on, a, on a Likert scale, so four-point scale. With five, we picked five categories that are related to politeness, sort of uh, folk categories. We said, how respectful was the officer? How polite, how friendly, how formal, and how impartial? So everybody had to label every sentence um, on one of these scales. So we had a whole bunch of labels. And then what we often do in these kind of social science studies, we have these um, uh, folk categories of, we don't know what people think of the word respectful or the word polite. So then we run PCA and we ask, what are the underlying latent variables that account for these five variables? And we ended up with two principal components. And we call those two principal components respect and formality. Um, and, um, and in green at the bot, uh, I'm colorblind, but the, the bottom one looks like it's green on respect and the top one looks to me like it's yellow, so I'm gonna call them green and yellow. So the, um, the, on the left scale is respect, and on the right scale is formality. Police were more respectful to white people, but they were not more formal to white people. So there, the language of, of you, uh, people were equally um, formal or distant or close or warm or friendly, you could call that second dimension, but there was a difference in respect. All right, so that's our, um, our uh, human study, but we'd like to compute respect automatically. And the intuition is we'd like not to have to bring people into the lab, have 400 um, sentences excised, and have students label each sentence. We'd like to be able to run this on every stop by, um, by the Oakland police and by every police department in the country, and there are millions of these stops every day. It's a huge amount of data that we'd like to look at. So NLP to the rescue, so here's our idea. We're gonna take linguistic theories of respect, we're gonna formalize them, we'll develop a, a, a formal model of respect, then we'll take the human label data and use that to help learn weights about this formal model so we can understand it, and then we'll build a, a formal respect classifier. And we do this by drawing on work we had done earlier on computational politeness. Um, this is work that Kristen Danescu Nicolescu Mazil was the first author on, where we looked at politeness on the web in like Wikipedia editor talk pages and questions on Stack Exchange. And, and I'll start with the results and come back to the methods. So we discovered, for example, in this paper that politeness correlates with social role. So as you might guess, Midwesterners are more like the non-Midwesterners, <laughs> we're able to prove this. Sadly, as a Python programmer, Ruby programmers are more polite than Python programmers. Python programmers were the rudest of all programmers. Um, none of you will be shocked to know that women were more polite than men, sadly. And even more sadly, um, it turns out that power corrupts. So if you're elected to an admin position, you become less polite immediately after the election in these Wikipedia things. All right, so this is our finding, and we're gonna apply this to the traffic stops, but let me tell you how the method works. Um, and to tell you about the method, I have to talk about some faculty, many of whom, or all of whom actually, at some point, were at Berkeley. Um, Goffman, the sociologist, Robin, who just, Lakoff, who just retired from linguistics, and, and, and Penny Brown and Stephen Levinson, who were here in passing various times. Um, and the idea is that, um, Respect is not about saying please and thank you. We're not just about saying please and thank you. And Goffman and Lakoff um, does, uh, focused on this idea that there's two, two kinds of face, two kinds of politeness. So negative politeness is your desire not to be told what to do. So if I say, Marty, s stand up, that sounds very rude. I've imposed on Marty. I've, I'm, 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 I'm causing her social peril if she doesn't stand up. She's being rude to me. So in order to, to soften my request, I might say, oh, Marty, I dropped my pen under your feet. Could you stand up for a second? I've given her a reason why she should stand up. Or I might say, could you stand up just for a second? I'm minimizing my request. So request impose on people. There's a social peril. And politeness is a way of minimizing this social threat. So we could minimize the request. I could say, just stand up for a second. Or we could put on record that it's in a, I know I'm, oh, I'm so sorry I'm bothering you, but. Okay, so that's a, that's a fact about, um, that's a strategies of negative politeness. And those appeal to our negative face, our desire not to be impeded. Um, and so all of you I know get a negative polite request every day. I know you're busy. Uh, I just have this one little paper. Could you review it for me? So I'm minimizing the request is just one paper and I'm putting on record that I know I'm, I'm, so this is negative politeness. We get this all the time. Okay, and there's lots of ways to measure negative politeness in police language. So you could say, you could apologize, you could, imp, you could minimize the imposition. You could use words like it's okay or don't worry, or you could use all,
these lovely English hedges. We have lots of dictionaries of hedges, just or a little or kind of. I just, could you just do this thing for me, just this little thing? So we can measure all these things automatically. So that's negative politeness. Positive politeness is your desire to be paid respect. Um, so this is, how, how do I emphasize your value and our relationship with each other? So I might say, oh, that was a really beautifully written review. You must have spent a lot of time on it. Or they might call me Professor Jurafsky. Um, or, so they're appealing to my sense of self-worth, and they're flattering me and mentioning our relationship. So that's emphasizing our values. So I'm being polite to you and emphasizing that you're an important person, and I appreciate you. And lots of cues we could build for positive politeness. So titles, and, and by introducing myself, I'm showing that I care about your knowing who I am. Um, I might mention that I care about your safety. So I talk about you as a person, drive safely. That's emphasizing my, my concern for your safety. And we just built a classifier. So we took the human data and, um, and uh, trained a, a classifier on, on lots of features related to these, these linguistic things, these hedges and apologies and all these things. And it does very well at predicting the human labels on these 400 sentences. And as you might expect, the kind of things officers say that are high in respect are the things you might expect. Apologies, saying thank you, reassuring people, you know, this, I just need you to fill out this form, you're not gonna get arrested, these kind of things, or please drive safely, I care about your safety, this kind of stuff, all high in respect. So now we have a classifier that's designed with linguistic features, weighted by human data, and now we can just run it on all the sentences and tell you how polite every sentence is. So we end up with an automatically assigned respect score and also a formality score, but I'm going to ignore formality for now. And every sentence has a, just a number. So here's some numbers. Here's um, the sentence, sorry to stop you, my name is Officer X with the police department. So that apologizes, the officer introduces themselves, and that's pretty polite. Here's an even more polite one. Um, the officer calls the person ma'am, expresses a concern for her safety, asks her to drive safe, uses the word please, even more polite. All right, so we have a number for every sentence. Now we can ask, controlling uh, for various things, is there an effective race? Are officers more respectful to white people than black people or vice versa? And so we just do what we normally do in these kind of social science experiments. You run a, uh, you run a logistic regression classifier, you code for lots of confounds, you have random intercepts, and you ask, is there an effective race? So I'm going to jump to the results, and then I'm going to talk about the confounds, how you control for confounds. So um, interestingly, officers are more respectful to older drivers. That's kind of nice. You would like, my parents are pretty old, and uh, I'd like officers to be respectful to them when driving. That's kind of nice to know. Not as nice to know, officers are more respectful to white drivers. No significant disrespect to black drivers. The level of respect by the human labels was in general pretty high. It's just that it was higher to white people than to black people. Let me show you some examples. There's more positive politeness to white drivers. So um, formal titles. So white drivers are more likely to be called sir or ma'am in examples like, like this. Or, or be called Mr. All right, Mr. X. Sir, all right, sir, take care. White drivers were more likely to receive um, positive politeness concerns for safety. So drive safely. You have a safe night. I just want you and your baby to be safe. So these are concerns, natural concerns that an officer is expressing, expressing that they care about the person. This is positive politeness. I care about you is positive politeness. Also more negative politeness to white drivers. So reassurance, no problem. I just, you know, it's gonna be okay. Just give me your license. Don't worry about that, it's all good. No big deal, just get these things fixed. Just have somebody sign, lots of just, just is really beautiful. Just is all over the speech um, to white drivers. So whenever you have a social sign, whenever like as a person trained in linguistics and, 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 and NLP, social science is like a new thing for me. Whenever you have a social science question, you have to do what social scientists do, which is care a lot about what's the cause of this effect and could it be caused by a million possible confounds. So we, we looked at as many confounds as we could figure out how to look at. So one confound you might guess is, well, maybe this is an effect of race. Maybe it's black drivers are more polite to black drivers, and I mean, black police are more uh, polite to black drivers, and white police are more polite to white. It's like a cross-racial effect or something. Um, no, it turns out there is no effect of officer race. Um, 
it's also, this, this, is the, this shows the, um, each plot, each little Gaussian is of a different officer race. Um, black, white, let's see, it's black, other, and white, I think in that order. Um, and you can see that they're all centered a little bit to the right. The x-axis is how much more polite are they to white drivers than black drivers. And everything is centered a little bit to the right of, of the median. So all, all to the right of zero. So all officers, officers of all races are equally slightly more likely to be polite to white drivers. And there's n this is not caused by a couple outlying officers. Those are beautiful Gaussians. All officers do, or in general, officers do this. Another possible confound, maybe um, this disparity is caused by maybe just police are more respectful in, in nicer neighborhoods. They're just nervous in, in, uh, in dangerous neighborhoods and they get more rude. So maybe if we just looked at the controls for the crime rate in the neighborhood, we would see this respect racial difference go away. So we controlled for the crime rates in all of Oakland neighborhoods and there is no effect. Maybe officers are less respectful to men. Maybe it's about gender, not about race. No difference in gender. Maybe it's about being a criminal. So maybe officers are just ruder to people that they know are, let's say, on probation or parole. Um, and people on probation or parole, maybe they view them as criminals. So we removed all the, all the stops in which somebody got searched. When, when someone's on probation or parole, they're, they're searched when they're stopped. So we just removed all of the searches. So nobody left on probation or parole. With the remaining stops, police are still more respectful to white drivers. Maybe the difference is because the raiders are college students. So um, you know, lots of psychology studies are done with freshmen. And you know, freshmen are just a bad model of humanity in general, as you all know. Um, Apologies to any freshmen here. Um, so we replicated the study with, the, with a, a large racial, uh, racially diverse sample that exactly mirrors the demographics of Oakland, California. So where would you go to get a large racially diverse sample that mirrors the demographics of Oakland, California? No, no, in Oakland. Baseball game, public school. DMV, that's where we went. We went to the DMV because this, is, this was Nick Camp, the psychology student's brilliant innovation. They're in line for two hours. They're bored. They're so happy to get, get 10 bucks for giving you um, experimental data and their exact racial um, mix of the, of the state, a and age for that matter. It's like a great um, experimental method that all, all psychologists should be using. That could, that could very well be. It could very well be, although even with appointments, I've made appointments before, you still end up waiting. <laughs> so yeah. Um, still, way better than, than random Stanford freshmen. Um, anyway, so now we have human, human labels from a very diverse population of human labelers. And uh, once again, police are still more respectful to white drivers. And you may also be interested to know, doesn't matter the race of the person who's rating respect. Like people agree what counts as a respectful utterance, whatever their race. Um, more confounds. Maybe police are more polite to white people because white people are stopped for more minor offenses and the officer is just more, um, uh, uh, when, when an offense is more serious, the officer is in a more grave situation and is, and is, and is being less uh, respectful. So we had police officers code every stop for the severity of the infraction. So from a very small thing, uh, uh, expired registration, to something very serious like speeding. So all of the, we now have a label for every infraction in every one of these thousand stops, and we know um, exactly how severe it is. Um, so maybe, it's, maybe the black drivers are doing more severe things. It turns out to be the opposite. The black drivers are stopped for less severe things on average. So if officers are being more polite to um, people who are less severe, they should have been more polite to the black drivers. Um, maybe the racial disparity is caused by a, a racial difference in outcome. So maybe there's a difference on whether you um, uh, let somebody off with a warning or write them a citation. If you put that variable in, there is no effect on the racial difference. Maybe, 
you, so you can see social science, there's a lot of control variables. Maybe the racial disparity is in words, but not in tone of voice. We could look at tone of voice. And we know from lots of computational linguistic research that prosody and tone of voice in general is a very important cue to social meaning. I've put up some fun papers for you. Um, could we look at the racial differences just in the police prosody? So what we did is we um, replicated the lab study just with prosody. We did the following. Take 15 second tiles of officer speech, so take, take the officer talking for 15 seconds, and then low pass filter it, meaning anything under 500 hertz get, gets through and everything above doesn't. So you mostly can't, you can't hear any consonants and you mostly can't tell what vowels they were. You just hear kind of a Charlie Brown speech. I'm gonna play you an example of it. And now hearing that, ask humans to label how respectful was this speech. It's a very hard task for humans to do. So I'm gonna play you some of it, see if I can do this. Is it working? It's not working. No sound? Okay. I'm gonna try, oh, let's see what happens. All right, let me try it again. Maybe your audio is Oh, maybe my, that's true, it could be my audio. Let's see here. Okay, let me try it again. I will try one more thing and then I'll give up on the audio. Can you hear that or no? Okay, that was somebody who's rated as talking down. And I'm going to play you somebody who's rated as being respectful. Okay, so you, there's some kind of difference there. Maybe the talking down one is like has more sharp, like pitch drops, and maybe the respectful one is kind of slower and has more rises. It's hard to know what's going on. Um, oops. Um, but um, people can tell the difference. Uh, and once again, there's a racial difference. Officers are more respectful, more warm, and more at ease when talking to white drivers. And we're in the middle of trying to figure out what that is and our way of trying to figure it out. Like what's the, what are the prosodics of politeness? Um, nobody's worked on this. Um, is to um, have, is redo the experiment instead of 15 seconds, have them, have people um, uh, uh, look look just at the same phrase, like license and registration, please, and get lots of examples of that, and then have people rate that. And there we have, we, have the ex we know it's the exact same string of words, so we can look very carefully just at what the prosodic differences are. Um, so we're in the middle of that. All right, so uh, racial differences after controlling for everything we could think of. Um, I, I wanna make it clear, um, we don't know what causes these disparities. Disparities don't necessarily mean racial bias. Bias is a fact, is what's going on in the officer's head about why they do something. We don't know that. What we know is that there's, a, there's disparate treatment. Um, something is happening differently to black drivers than white drivers, we should fix it. Doesn't matter what's, what's the cause of it. Um, disparities might be partially caused by driver language. Maybe drivers are rude and then officers are rude. That can't be the main cause of our results. And the reason is, first of all, that the lab study with people who were rating the officer's utterances, they saw the previous utterance of the driver. So they knew what the driver said when the officer said something. And if we look across the interaction, we find racial disparities right at the beginning. So here's the plot of respect on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, and the greeny looking thing on top is um, white drivers and the red looking thing on, uh, uh, is uh, black drivers. And from the very beginning, officers are just more polite to white drivers before the driver really has time to say anything. Interestingly, there is like, th there's no difference in formality and we can see formality dropping across the conversation as officer becomes a little more uh, comfortable with the interaction. Um, what police chiefs care a lot about is keeping people from getting killed. And um, escalation is one source 
of violence that we would like to be able to measure with NLP. So could, for example, it be the case that if officers are more respectful, the interaction is less likely to go sour and people are less likely to get killed, which would be a great thing to avoid. Um, so we did our, we're just, this is work in progress now. We looked just at two lexicons of swear words and words related to anger, and we asked, if officers are more respectful, do the drivers use less anger words? Um, so simple first experiment, you just look at officer respect at the beginning of the interaction, how does that correlate with how angry the motorist is in the rest of the interaction? Um, and sure enough, the more respectful along the x-axis the officer is, the lower the driver anger. So in, and that, there's no race effect in this. For all people, if you're respectful to them, they're not angry, which is a sensible result you would have expected. So in conclusion, study one, officers are less respectful to black community members, even in very everyday encounters, no arrest, no searches, no use of force, even though the black community members are stopped for less severe offenses, and they do this in words and in tones of voice. And this matters not just for fairness, which ought to be enough, but also for everybody's safety, the driver and the officer, um, and something that we uh, need to be able to fix. All right, so that's the end of study one. I want to do study two, and then I'm going to talk about some implications. So, Study one just looked at this one variable, politeness. In study two, I want to look at more rich NLP kinds of structures. And this study was done actually w in collaboration with Berkeley, with um, Nelson Morgan and um, Hong Su, who are at ICSI Berkeley, um, in this, uh, who did speech there. And this, this the, um, first author of this paper is Vinod Prabhakaran. And we drew on this famous result from um, NLP that, that specifically task-oriented dialogues, dialogues in which the goal is to perform some task, they have a structure that mirrors the structure of the task. So for example, here's again an, a random officer conversation with somebody, and the structure of the conversation m m mirrors the thing the officer is trying to do. They greet the person, they tell them why they stopped them, they ask them for the facts they need to fill in their form, they talk about the sanction they're issuing, and then they, they take a farewell. So all the things they do in this are things they ha they're doing for this task that they have to do. Um, and there's a lot of policy implications in what we, what this kind of stuff, the dialogue structure, the way, am I asking details, am I issuing a sanction? So one is, departments require officers to give the driver the reason for the stop. So they have to say something like, the reason I pulled you over is because you were texting. Um, maybe if drivers don't give the reason, that could lead to problematic or escalating encounters. Another policy implication is that black community members complain they get asked intrusive investi investigatory questions, especially in certain neighborhoods, a lot, but, no, but we haven't been able to quantify this. I put up the one, uh, one book where they tried to quantify this and it's quite hard, but we have the data to quantify this. Can we see differences in who gets asked, is this your car or do you live here? So um, we, we um, took from sociology the idea of what's called institutional talk. So institutional talk is this idea, again, that, that if you're in an institution, if you're doing some institutional task, the structure of the dialogue relates to your, um, your, the thing you're doing in the task and your roles in the task. If I'm an officer, I have a role, I'm supposed to ask people things. Um, and, and so there's task-oriented things that we want to be able to measure. And so we came up with a labeling set of 23 labels, I've shown you a few of them here, that officers could be doing in an in a utterance. So they could be um, giving a reason for a stop, they could be issuing a sanction, they could be saying drive safe, they could be asking if this is your car, they could be mentioning that they're gonna be lenient, like I'm gonna give you a break. They, these are things dialogue acts officers, speech acts officers can take. So we labeled a bunch of these by hand, I won't go into the details, and then built NLP classifiers using standard algorithms. So we were looking at the words and looking at the parse tree and looking at the embeddings and all these things that we normally do in building classifiers. Um, and, and this is all work in progress now. This, um, and so um, I'm showing you an uh, F score. That number 89 is we can do pretty well if I give you, um, if, I, if I transcribe the entire conversation and I take each officer's sentence and I pass it to the classifier and I say, which dialogue act was this? We can do about 89% F score, which is pretty good. Now I can take this um, classifier and I run it on all the stops and I can ask, are there racial differences? And here I've got just preliminary results because we're in the middle of running all these experiments. We haven't got all the controls done yet. Um, but it looks like um, blacks are less likely to be told the reason for the stop. Um, so, and um, 
if they're told the reason for the stop, it looks like they're told later in, the a in their action on average than whites. So this result we're still working on. Um, um, lenience, so blacks are twice as likely to be told that they're getting off easy, like I'm doing you a favor, I'm giving you a break, I'm letting you off with a warning, we'll let you slide on that. Um, sort of implying that they deserve more serious punishment than they're getting. Um, but officers are not, in fact, more lenient to blacks. They're equally likely to be lenient to blacks as to whites, and blacks are stopped for less serious offenses. So they're sort of implying lenience, but there is no lenience, and there's kind of no reason for the lenience. Blacks are indeed more likely to be asked if this is their car. Is this car registered to you? Who does this car belong to? Does the car belong to you? And now, for all of these things, we could ask, do these things lead to problematic interactions? So look at driver anger if the officer doesn't give the reason right at the beginning of the, the um, stop. And sure enough, drivers are more angry when there's no reason given than when there is a reason given, suggesting this may lead to escalation. Um, so in conclusion, black community members experience very different police conversations than whites. Whites are likely to be told why, the reason for the stop, to have the officer express concern for their safety. Blacks are more likely to be asked if this is their car, to be told the officer is cutting them a break. And these differences lead to more driver, may lead to more driver anger. We, we don't know yet. It just looks like there's more anger. We're in the middle of this study, um, which has Im implications for everybody's safety. Okay, so, so far, everything I've done has been hiring transcribers and transcribing words, which is extremely annoying. Um, we'd like to do this from raw speech. So again, a collaboration with ICSI, we'd like to um, run speech recognition and try to do this. And we have, this is important because nobody is going to replicate these findings on a random police department if they have to fly transcribers across the country to get background checked. We have people to do this automatically. And there's lots of privacy reasons why it would be great to have a machine measure something and not have a bunch of humans look at, at every um, interaction. So here's what we did. We, we built a um, standard speech recognition system. We trained it on the police data. It's not that much data, so we added various other kinds of data. You can ask me the details if you're interested later. We took lots of other conversations. We did all the tricky things you do to get more data when you have less data. Um, you do renoising and you do data augmentation, so you, you in speech, like, instead of just sampling every 10 milliseconds and then shifting and sampling another 10 milliseconds, you can just, like, shift the data by, by one millisecond and then resample again, and you get, like, 10 times as much data that looks a little different. Anyway, we do all these things. Um, so now, we, here's our pipeline. We have our audio file from a, a body camera. We have to diarize it, so we have to decide who's talking. Is it the police? Is it the community member? Is it the police talking to the dispatcher? Is it the dispatcher? And so on. So we remove everybody except the police. And now we run it through a speech recognizer, and we get an, an, a list of possible utterances, some NBEST list. And now we run our classifier, and we get a, a class, a speech act class. Um, and I won't go into the details of, of all of this, but for example, to do the diarization, we want to be able to pull out noise, pull out the, whether the police is talking, tell if it's the dispatcher talking, tell if it's the officer talking to the dispatcher, and all this kind of stuff. So I'll just show you like one of the classifiers, the, the police voice activity. So we're going to run this over the data and just ask, what's the probability that at this millisecond the officer is talking? Um, and so we just build a neural net for that, trained on the hand-labeled thousand conversations, um, which just walks over and, and tells you if the officer is talking. So we use that as our officer probability detector, and then we look at that data. So now, um, I, I showed you before um, uh, how well we're doing at, um, at uh, the task of if I gave you the exact transcript and I told you the segmentation, and, and I just grab, grabbed one police utterance, how well can I do at detecting um, the dialogue act? Um, we can do about 78% accuracy on that with perfect text. If I run a speech recognizer, but I still know the boundaries of when the officer is talking, about 65 F score. Um, and if I'm, if I'm doing this just from complete, I just take a recorder and I just run software from scratch, end to end, I get about 60 F score. N these numbers are not good enough to be used in practice. This is not a solved problem. However, 
detecting every single institutional act, every dialogue act in an utterance, in a whole conversation, isn't our goal. Our goal is often just asking, did a reason occur, yes or no, binary question. I don't care where it happened. Did the officer give the reason for the stop? Was somebody asked intrusive questions? And that's a much easier task. Instead of a sequence labeling task of labeling exactly where something happened in, in, a, in a 10 minute conversation, it's did somebody ask about reasons somewhere? Much easier task, and that we can do much more accurately. So that's the 89% number I showed you earlier if I have perfect text, but I can do 81% on this task um, for telling if a particular act happened somewhere in the conversation. I can do very well on that task all the way from raw audio. So this kind of task is now ready for departments to run it on actual data. So what are we doing going forward? So the first thing we're doing right now is we're looking at the community member speech. So these two studies are all on officer speech. We want to know how are the community members talking? Can we measure whether they're disrespectful? Can we measure if they're compliant? Can we measure if they're anxious sounding? Can we predict escalation? And for this, we have video, because the cameras, remember, body-worn cameras are pointing at the driver. We don't have video of the officer, but we have video of the driver. We could do things with, with mouth movements and things. That's kind of our exciting next thing. And what we're in the middle of right now is a collaboration with the Oakland Police Department is they, they together with us, built training materials based on the results of these, um, this data. So we pulled out good and bad interactions, um, had the police chiefs simulate them be uh, on video, and then they use that now in their training for officers, and we're going to then retest officers after training to see if these things change. So, conclusion, um, the first automated NLP analysis, I think the first analysis anywhere of body camera footage sort of in the large as opposed to looking at an individual event, confirming um, lots of reports about disparate treatment of black Americans and we hope will let us to measure and, and um, improve officer training. And this is just one kind of social meaning and uh, our lab works a lot on applying NLP and speech to social meaning of various kinds. We're looking right now at framing of migration. We're looking at government controlled media like in Russia and how they do agenda setting. We have some really fun projects on things like schizophrenia diagnosis and toxic speech detection. But I wanna, I wanna end in my last five or 10 minutes today by talking about something that's much lighter, um, which is food. So food is also an application of NLP to everyday language. Um, and it has implications for data science. Um, and so I want to just talk about three quick studies, one of which is older, and, and a couple of which are much, we just came out um, recently. So one of the older studies, um, we asked, what could you learn from restaurant reviews about the reviewer? So I've shown you here a negative review from Yelp, a one-star review. I've, the dot, dot, dots are me compressing it to fit on the screen. It's a very long review otherwise. Um, so the bartender was horrible and we waited 10 minutes and we didn't get our attention. What do you notice about the language of this um, one star review? Nothing. Nothing about the food, right? The, the food is never mentioned. Um, it's about what? It's about service. It's about somebody was rude to somebody. So that got us thinking, we went and looked, this is with my collaborators who were uh, at Carnegie Mellon at the time, we looked at um, we looked at all the one-star reviews and asked what are the linguistic characterizations of a one-star review. And they are negative, obviously, that's kind of what it means to be a one-star review, so they have words like horrible and awful. But they also had things we were not expecting to see. They were in the past tense, they were past tense narrative, they were stories about people, lots of pronouns and names of people. Um, and they over-mentioned the words we, us, and our. So they were um, past tense narratives that over-mentioned we, us, an hour, and we went to the literature, and there is a genre that has exactly these characteristics, past tense narratives, over mentioning the first person plural, negative people narratives, and it's narratives written by people suffering trauma. <laughs> so this is the work of Jamie Pennybaker at Austin. So if you have suffered a trauma, you write in the past tense, like this trauma happened in the past, I'm trying to get beyond it, and you use we and us, because this trauma happened to us as a group, and together we will you know, make it through. Um, so in other words, one-star reviews are trauma narratives. Um, and you know, it's not about the food at all. They're all trauma narratives about, not trauma about eating greasy food, they're trauma about someone being mean to them. It's all about face. It's the same as we saw with face in the, in the police study. Everything is about personal interaction in the end. So that's the negative reviews. Um, here's what the positive reviews look like. <laughs> They're, um, as you can see, when somebody likes a restaurant, they compare it to sex, but only if it's expensive. 
Um, so I have Yelp price along the x-axis and number of mentions of sex along the y-axis. And you can see the more expensive um, the restaurant, the more they mention sex. Cheap restaurants, we get words like addiction, crack, crave. In other words, cheap restaurants are like drugs. <laughs> this is my most perfect graph as a social scientist. Um, um, so why is that? Why would cheap food be like drugs? Um, so partly it's like, it's a neg we looked at what kind of food people were talking about in these cheap restaurants, and it was junk food, so they're feeling guilty. And by talking about it as a drug, um, it's not my fault I ate this junk food because I was addicted to it, and it's like a medical thing, and it's, you know, the locus of control is in the food itself. Um, and we noticed, in fact, uh, women are much more, um, lots of research, women are much more pressured to conform to healthy eating, and sure enough, they were feeling guiltier and using this metaphor more. Men, by the way, were more likely to, be, to, to use the language of trauma in the previous study. Um, so, in other words, hidden in this, in just, just reviews are facts not about the food, but about the social and emotional state of the reviewer and our subconscious cultural norms about eating. Um, I'll give you a few more um, uh, implications. Now we looked at menus, 6,000 online menus. Here's um, the language used in middle-priced restaurants. That's your, your, your California pizza kitchens or your cheesecake factories. Um, lots of beautiful sensory adjectives. That's your zesties and golden browns and crispies. Um, if you're a cheap restaurant, you don't, use, you don't call your food crispy. You call your food delicious or gourmet or flavorful. You use kind of a vague, useless adjective that doesn't really mean anything. And in fact, every time you add one of these adjectives, your dish price drops 2%. <laughs> Whereas expensive menus are really short. And this is a, um, explained by a classic um, explanation of Grice. You know, if I say the word fresh to you, it's because you might not know the food is fresh, because I want to explain to you the food is fresh. And if I'm an expensive restaurant, I don't want you to be explaining the food is fresh. I want to assume the food is fresh, so we just don't mention it at all. And this exact Gricean implication um, becomes a useful historical tool. So this is the New York Public Library's um, Butoff collection, which some, some of Marty's students in a previous class did some, this really nice analysis of their, um, the language in these old menus. And this is a collection, by the way, that it was David that first drew my attention to many years ago. Um, so if you look at the word real in this data set, um, uh, you, you could ask, when do people start talking about food as real? So in the 1960s, people first mention real butter on menus. In the 1970s, they first mention real whipped cream on menus. And in the 1990s, people first mention real bacon on menus. And each of these is about 20 years after that food became popular. So the margarine tax was repealed in the 50s. Whipped cream is introduced to artificial cream in the 60s, bacon in the 70s. So in other words, the word real is an excellent marker of non-real food. So that just the idea of uh, that you mention things that are not there is a useful historical tool. So that's what cheap restaurants do. What expensive restaurants do instead is use um, what Bourdieu called arbitrary distinctions of educational and cultural capital. They mark, um, they mark uh, that they're the kind of thing that educated, fancy people go to. So they use rare words. They use words that aren't rare but are just long, like exquisitely, and they say accompaniments and not sides. And you can measure this also because we're scientists with a graph. Um, the, the more um, expensive the restaurant, you're paying about 18 cents on average per letter when you're adding extra letters. So our most recent studies, these just came out. Um, uh, so we looked at how menus are selling healthy food. So lots of menus, like the Cheesecake Factory, have um, a healthy section at the back. Theirs is called the skinny licious menu. So we just looked at what words are mentioned on that menu. So I'll first tell you what words are not on a healthy menu. Um, words about exciting, crazy, fiery things, um, salty, tangy, those beautiful adjectives are not there. Words about indulgence or succulence. So that's, the, no, those words do not appear on healthy menus. Here's the words that appear in healthy menus. Dry, mild, plain, simple. So as you can imagine, that doesn't sound very appetizing. Um, so um, in fact, the goal of these healthy men menus is to get people to eat healthy, but they're completely designed so no one orders the food on them. 
And there are practical implications to all these. So um, my colleagues from, the, from this food study went, went and ran a study in the dorms um, where they just changed the descriptions of the food um, of vegetables. And um, we, if you describe carrots as zesty, people eat more of them. Um, and then uh, the final study I want to talk about is a, a recent study we've just been doing. I've talked about some, with some of you about this today. Um, here we're, we're looking at, um, at, food, at food and other words. We want to predict some non-linguistic outcome, like will somebody buy this product from the language of a, pro of a, of a product ad? And this was a collaboration with Rakuten, a Japanese company. And Rakuten is an online marketer that's, that has lots of, of little storefronts, each of which is a different company selling sometimes the exact same product. So we have five companies selling the exact same product but using different words. So we, can, we have a perfect st social science study. We can ask which words cause more sales. And here's the problem, that the words that are easy, that predict sales, they're very easy to find, they're kind of useless. They're words like the brand, name of the brand, like Prada or Johnny Walker. But we're trying to understand how to cause sales to increase. Obviously, if I sold a better product, we could sell more. We want to know what the other words are that the advertiser could change. So we want to find what words are good predictors of sales and not related to brand or price. And there's lots of ways to do this. Um, you can run regressions, and you can put in control factors. And it turns out they don't work very well when your job is to find words. So we, we used the v very um, hip right now idea of adversarial networks. So here's the idea. We'll build a neural network whose job is to find words that are very good at predicting, let's say, number of sales, and very bad at predicting brand and price. Um, and then we'll find which, which are the words that make the network work. So let's just see how well you are at being an adversarial network. So I've got two Japanese ads, and I've translated them above for those of you like me who don't speak Japanese, um, for the exact same product. These are for the same exact candy bar. Um, so how many people think A sold more? You've got to pick one. I'm going to make you raise your hand. OK, how many people think B sold more? I think that was B. You guys are very split, which is interesting. But um, yeah, I think you generally pick B, although many of you picked A. So let's go see what happens. So here's the architecture. We, um, I'm not going to show you the details. But yeah, it's a neural network whose job is to, you train the network with a, the normal backprop gradients to predict sales. And you just flip the gradients when you're predicting price or brand so that you become worse at predicting price or brand and ask, what are the words that help me do this with attention? And I'm just going to jump to the results. So um, here's the words in, in these Japanese ads for these particular products um, that increase sales. Appealing to the authority of the staff, like mentioning the staff and how they know a lot. Traditional seasonal gifts and regions that you have seasonal gifts. Um, and lots of politeness markers. So you should be polite, and you should appeal to what your staff knows. So which one sold more? A, A sold more. Um, Yes, lots of mentions of standard souvenirs and our staff's knowledge and so on. OK, so in, in conclusion, conclusion. So here we're applying NLP to lots of everyday language, things that are very socially relevant, things that are maybe a little more fun, but still have you know, per perfectly good implications for computational advertising and, and whatnot. And I want to point out that the interaction is also in the research program. Like all of this work required students who were in different buildings and departments to talk to each other, and that's really important. And I also feel like it's really important to bring humans into natural language processing, something that a lot of you in this audience I know are doing here, um, which is um, take ideas from social science or social theory and bring them into natural language processing. And I'm going to leave you with um, uh, my, one of my favorite quotes from my um, colleague, Herb Clark. The common misconception is that language has to do with words and what they mean. It doesn't. It has to do with people and what they mean. And I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you. And, and maybe talk into the microphone for your quest. Take a microphone, because we're, we're recording. I think there's one right to the right of you, Marty. On the uh, traffic stops, did you control at all for the uh, number of people besides the driver in the vehicle? We didn't. We do, in some cases, know how many drivers there are. I feel like that, that, oh, sorry. Yeah, we, oh, I don't have to repeat the question, because it's recorded. Um, oh, you don't have to repeat it. Yeah, we know. Um, it didn't seem, it didn't look like it mattered much, and occasionally there were more than one driver, and we 
we have that data, I don't trust it completely. Like the officers mark it down. No, that's a good hypothesis. We could check that. Yeah, do, does having your family in the car, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a cool hypothesis. Yeah. And I was wondering if you looked at, I think this is on. Is it working? Recording, yeah. Um, make, model, age, condition of car? Yeah, great question. So yeah, we thought about looking at the model of the car because that could help us decide something about maybe um, socioeconomic class. Like the first social science question you should ask is, is it race or is it class? Um, it, it's not clear the car could for sure tell us that if we could find it. It also turns out the car is in a different database in Sacramento. So um, it, it's possible that we could detect the model for most cars from some of the text the officer writes. But yeah, it's a, it's a cool idea and just a lot of trouble. Oh, yeah, I see, I see. Yeah, especially it makes sense if we're looking at the, um, the point was what about the, for the recording, uh, specifically the language, like the, if the person is uh, particularly unempowered, is their language gonna be different? So when we start looking at the language of the drivers, yeah, knowing their social class would be huge. Yeah, that's a really good point. In the back. Yep. So in the uh, policing study, have you run models with police officer fixed effects so that you could see like the same police officer in different interactions and whether Yeah, we have police officer random effects. So th the police officer is a random factor. Okay, so but have you run it with fixed effects too? Um, I mean, we could look at in, you mean to ask whether police officers act differently in different cases. Yeah, um, so it's like you're getting a within police officer estimate. I see. Um, no, we could try that. I mean, there isn't a lot of variance even among, even between officers. Um, but so I wouldn't expect much inside officers, but yeah, we could check, yeah. My question was related to that, so I'll ask as a follow-up. Um, like, using like that same model, it would be interesting to see, I guess it sounds like there's not differences between officers, but if there were to see if they changed over time, so as, like, yeah, as the officers interacted with people of different races, if like that, if that fixed. Nice question, so we do have, I have two answers to that. One is we did check the officer's level of experience, and that doesn't matter. Um, but the second question, what we're really gonna try to do is does it change with training? We're running training now, or they're running training now. They, uh, it's, and um, and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna retest and find out. So hope, I'm hoping the answer is yes, because I'm an optimistic human being, yeah. Um, can you say a little bit more about uh, your concepts of respect and formality on the one hand, and positive and negative politeness on the other? There's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to uh, map yeah, those so, two. So yeah, so right. So, Formality, we really didn't, we didn't look into formality much and model it very much. Um, so it's really about respect. So um, how to say it? So in linguistics, the word for, the theories for describing how you behave respectfully to somebody are positive and negative politeness. And I was talking to people about this today, like why do we call it politeness instead of respect? Or why is it just positive and negative politeness? Because you can imagine lots of different ways we have face and it's not just not being impeded and being flattered. Um, it just happens to be what the literature calls it. So, um, for example, some literatures divide up politeness or respect into three categories, like something like positive, something like negative, and something about like, le like especially for languages like Japanese, like levels, of, levels of, of status, where status is explicitly marked, and that's kind of a dimension of respect. Um, so you could imagine other theory. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Well, it, to me, it concerns because there's um, three different authors' translations across the room, and you have two different data sets, one where you have audio and one where you just have uh, natural language words. And so when you make, uh, when you have conclusions, it's, it's hard to say like, how substantial are the differences um, that are based on just the general audience politeness when you also have this like, audio shape from Spanish. Um, Oh, you're talking about which, uh, sorry, I, I'm confused about which two studies you're talking about. Yeah, uh, so there, there's one where you had people reading audio. Yeah, so for, for we have people reading both text and uh, we have studies in the lab and then, N which are usually on small amounts, like subsets of the data, and then NLP studies where we can run it on everything. So studies in the lab, we've tried various ways of getting humans to label stuff. So you can use the word respect or the word res politeness or the word these kind of things and it all seems to work out wh whatever we call them. 
st the computational studies, there we're building models based on linguistic theories, and then we're setting the weights based on the human studies. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes. Oh, I, maybe, I, maybe what you're saying is we, 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 we studied, we asked humans to read the officer utterance, and in a different study, we asked them to listen to it without the words. We never combined them and said, listen to this sentence, combining all your knowledge of words and prosody, how polite is the officer? And it might have, we might have found much stronger effects by combining them. The only reason we didn't is um, then it wouldn't be a race-blind study. So then they would know the race of the officer. Now, maybe that wouldn't matter. But, but we're just being extra careful, yeah. Because they can hear the speech. Americans are very good at telling race from speech. Yeah, it wouldn't be 100%, but it would be way better than chance, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if the officer spoke African-American vernacular English at all, then yeah, people could label race. Yes, you're right that African-American vernacular English and Southern English are very overlapping, but they're not identical. So I've got two, two quick questions. Uh, first, can you tell us what it was like working with the OPD? Yeah, I mean, this, this all happened because Jennifer, my collaborator, she's very, like, this is her field. Not, I'm really the, the I'm, you know, what do you call it, parachuting in. Um, I'm, I'm the NLP person helping her research agenda. So she works on race and criminality and policing. So she has long ties with the department. She's been working with them for many years. So. Um, Otherwise, it would have been impossible. That's my first answer. Um, she knows everybody there. They trust her to do the research. She's, she's run officer training. She's talked to everybody. She has strong opinions about this, and she knows the literature. Um, but even with that, so uh, otherwise, and so because she's a researcher that works on this, they allowed, they, they, um, allowed her to look at the data. I don't think they would have talked to me at all. Um, but even after that, it's just so complicated. Like. To get the data required, like multiple grad students and Jennifer, like s spending a day sitting in the in the little computer lab, um, downloading data onto disks, because you know it's there's none of this is on the web and it's all like in some computer center in the basement in Oakland. So um, and yeah, every time that we try to run on more data, there's like all these complications and there's not like I said to the answer about the cars, like no, nothing is stored in the same data set database, and so, um, for example, the officer writes a, writes a form called the stop form that he fills out after, after each, um, later in the day maybe, fills out a form about what happened in that stop, and then there's the recording of that stop, and they're not, there's no unique ID that, share, that they share. The only unique ID you get is the timestamp, so we had to like align them by timestamping, which took a grad student a month, yeah. So it's, it's, you know, it's government data because it's, you know, it's people are, thank God they're keeping the data, but, um, but you know, they can't afford to hire a computer scientist to, to do stuff. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is, is and, and just to play devil's advocate a little sure. bit, why do you need NLP to do any of this? Good, because good, I mean, great so, question. I mean, for the part of, of politeness and respect, you do have human raters who are rating, who great are question. transcribing and giving ratings for exactly the same things. You right, measure right. We found, this, we found a racial difference in the human raters. Why bother doing NLP? Yeah. I have a very simple answer, which is the human rating study was on 400 sentences. And that's not enough to control for any of the confounds that we looked at. And, if, and so nobody would believe the results that could have been caused by, you know, black drivers doing this or neighborhood or the crime rate or the time of day or the officer seniority, but you can't test that. So NLP gives us the, the, the ability to run the same analysis on enough data that we can control for things. And, and that's, a huge, that's a huge ability. Yeah, and it's, it, and it's big enough that, you, that the error that you would get from this automatic process of predicting the level of respect is washed out or, 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 or random enough at least that it's not. Random easy. enough, so yeah, that's the good question. So what we try to do is at least show that for all of our classifiers, this is for all the papers, you show that their error is, is race blind. That if they make an error, they, certainly there's an error, but they're equally likely to misclassify blacks as whites. And then whatever the, the though there's an error rate, it's not gonna impact your main finding. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And I have another question. Yes. Which is probably, just the way it's done. David will be like, we didn't know that. Um, but why are you looking at this on a uh, sentence by sentence basis? 
practices. Like when I think about respect and politeness, I would look at an interaction, not at a sentence. And so I'm just wondering, is that the standard way to do it? Oh, it's no, it's just more fine grain. We could have taken, produced a single number for a whole interaction. I just wouldn't have trusted us. That's really more us as linguists. I like to look at individual sentences because an officer can get more and less respectful over time. So you could say, well, we should use like a distribution of something like that. And that's kind of what we did, right? We're, well, we're measuring all the sentences in the interaction and that helps us Right. get a mean for the, the interaction. So thinking, like when I have an interaction, if it starts out, you start out in a disrespectful way, but we end up in a, in a respectful place. My account of the interaction nice. might be that it was respectful. Nice. No. And so I'm wondering, yeah. That's totally reasonable. And so, yeah, that's a, a, a very reasonable thing, and we could capture that by adding, you know, the slope across the interaction of that variable, and we often do that kind of thing. We didn't in this study. But yeah, we could, we could instead run yeah, run by conversation instead of by utterance. You also get much more statistical power by utterance, obviously, because there's 100 times, two orders of magnitude more data. Um, th I mean, that's the, that's the easy answer. We can, we, you know, to control for all these things, we need more data. And, well, we, and we understand politeness at the sentence level more than we understand. Like, there's no good theory saying, well, you have a, a great hypothesis. I remember the last part. Um, but so, but does memory matter? Like, what's the actual thing we care I about? Remember the, the last one. I Let's say, I mean, yeah. I'm just, I mean, just as a random hypothesis, the slope matters, or the, the, you know, the how polite you were at the beginning, or how many times you responded to a question rudely. You can come up with a lot of totally reasonable features about the interaction as a whole, but we just didn't have a good theory of those. Yeah. 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 No reasonable questions. Actually, I think uh, Deirdre's point is really good, and. I think there are studies like that that show at the beginning or middle or end have a particular emotional valence that determines the feeling uh, at the, the outcome. But I, oh, in the negotiations? Yeah. But I don't yeah. actually know what the polarity is. And it might be that the beginning determines the outcome in these sorts of interactions. You had some data about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. When so we just looked at the beginning, yeah, so we chose to say, yeah, does your behavior in the beginning affect things? in the middle, but, so but yeah, so this is all, yeah, we could. You kind of do a, a moving window of, of, you know, tuples of interactions because you have the sentence level uh, interactions. So I think it's a really good idea for yeah. future work. super interesting just looking at the 400 that you did with the human coders to see, like, if you give them sentence by sentence and then you give, you know, another set the whole conversations, whether or not, even if they're doing the sentence by sentence kind of thing. But yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, yeah, that's a tough one because these are these are ten minutes. Like, I, I'm not sure I would. Well, yeah. an alternative would be just for some other data. You could have people have conversations, rate them the overall outcome versus the individual turns, and see if there's differences. Yeah. 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 yeah all good. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I know Nikki Jones did some work on this, looking at the beginning and middle end nice. of these uh, conversations and using a conversation I'm analysis approach. Yeah. Um, you, you could talk with her. She's yeah. great. She's in the uh, Ethnic Studies Department, I think, here at Berkeley. Um, and she, they found that the beginning was most important to setting the tone of the whole conversation. That is certainly what, I mean, the beginning, the reason we focused on the beginning is because Jennifer felt like that was the important part, and maybe she's read this literature. Yeah. So I wanted to ask about you, uh, the rates of you limited at the beginning to black and white. Was that throughout? But I thought it might Everywhere. be uh, other. Are you interested in looking at that? And there's just less data. I mean, there's there's probably enough Hispanic data, probably not enough Asian data to look at. And um, yeah, it's just we had to pick something to study, and it's easy to study a binary thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a totally reasonable thing to look at. And yeah, uh, considering all the data around. Um, dating that there is between races and genders and how they change and how they're different, that would be interesting to see how gender and um, race across different, <laughs> probably not enough data as you're saying, but as you're moving to different um, different areas, maybe outside of Oakland, that would be interesting. 
see how those interact. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there was no interaction between gender and race in our data. Like we hypothesized the officers would be ruder to black men, and they were not. So there was an age effect, and there was a race effect, but no interaction and no gender effect. But yeah, we, had, you, we might see it in different places, different race, racial mixes in different places. Yeah, totally reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, and there's one behind you after. Um, when you were talking about the line by line, they heard the sentence before, but they read it, and they don't know the gender. Right, they, right? Read, they yeah. read, the driver said X. Yeah. I, I should have had a picture. I have a picture in one of my slides, but it's not there. The driver said X, the officer said Y. How respectful was the officer? So it's all written. Talking about the importance of the beginning of the conversation, were you able to see a difference for conversations that were initiated by the officer versus those that were initiated by the driver? Because it seems to me that can make a big difference in who's controlling things. That's a great question. I don't think, I certainly have heard or looked at any case where it wasn't the officer speaking first, but there might have been, so, uh, I didn't read them all, there might have been somewhere the driver says hi, but um, that's a good question. We should just check. Because it might be where the driver, if, if, there is a, if the driver tries to, to take the uh, conversational initiative, you might expect very different things. It would shock me if there was a lot of that. But, um, but you're right, if there's any, it would be cool. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 just, yeah. Conversational initiative taking would be like an easy thing to check. Does that affect all sorts of things, yeah. I had a question about the second study, the um, sort of set of uh, routine utterances that you were looking at. Since you have those, are you um, thinking about modeling sequences of those and looking at you know, differences in what leads to what and potentially even um, predicting you know, the end of a conversation, the end of the, the stop? Or yeah, the we've done some sequence modeling on that. Um, uh, nothing incredibly exciting has happened yet, but that we're still working on the paper. We were, we, we, there, we certainly have seen like the, the prototypical sequence for a white driver is different than the prototypical sequence for a black driver. Black drivers are much more likely to be, to, the thing starts with um, uh, put your hands on the wheel and um, they're likely to get the reason a little bit later in the conversation. So there are different sequence differences, some of which I mentioned. Um, we're having trouble figuring out a good way to model all, because the, there's an infinite number of facts about the sequence, about how to, so we've, there's, there's a lot of NLP on things like take a sequence and induce a little finite automata that represents what things happen after what. And so we're, we can do that with this data, but, it's, but we haven't figured out what the questions are. Yeah, it's a, good, a great idea, though. Oh, correlation between politeness and length. No, I think we have length. Wait, I think length. Length is for sure correlated with race. Um, Which way? Black, black interactions are much longer. Um, that's raw interactions. Once you take out um, probation and parole and searches, as we did, then, it, then that goes mostly away. I don't think there's a length by politeness interaction, but I'm not positive that I rechecked. Quite, I think there was one back there. Or, okay, great. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask, hopefully it's not too off topic, but um, so how did you let this, could you comment a little bit more about how you let these results impact the training tangibly? Like did you just present the results and then extract examples and be like, these are examples that, of what we're talking about? Or how did you work with the department yeah, to Yeah, I worked out the training with the, with the Oakland police staff. And um, what, they, what, they, what they asked us to do was come up with a, a, um, a sample, respectful interaction where the officer does the things they're supposed to do. And from the data, fig, find one that the model thinks is a really bad one. And so we built like sort of fake, two fake conversations based on the data, and, and then the the um, police command staff all read them, and they, were, and they noticed stuff that we hadn't even noticed in them. They are like, oh yeah, that's rude for the following reason. That's why we say that. And, or this is polite for the following reason. This is why we do that. And then they, I think it was the, uh, one of the associate chiefs, um, read, read, you know, 
acted them out, and they recorded him acting him out as part of their general training about about how you deal with with traffic stop interactions. And then to fall like. To assess that training, you're going to look whether that bridge to, goes to down. To check the training, we're going to do the exact same thing we did before, but with, you know, with uh, November of 2018. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, I think we're going to end now. So let's uh, thank Anne for the fantastic talk. Thanks, everybody.